morning, everyone. So what I wanted to talk about today is around how India shops. Yesterday, I was making a presentation to a group of people at IM Bangalore. And one of the things that came up in the discussion was the fact that if you look at the Indian economy today, it is give or take about $1.4 trillion. If you look at the size of the consumption, that is close to a trillion dollars today. However, over the next eight years, that number is expected to increase to $3.6 trillion. Now, that is all a lot of numbers, but what does it mean in terms of implications for retailers, implications for people who are in the retail market, is something which I want to talk about today. I'm sure that many of you have seen some version of this Indian income pyramid at some point or the other, uh, you know, where you have the affluent, some people will put it at $18,000, some people will put it at $20,000, depending on where the dollar is, the number could actually go up by 10, 15%, up or down anyways. And you have this pyramid picture, and there are enough and more tomes talking about how this pyramid is going to change into a diamond and so on and so forth. In my view, this actually just tells you half the picture. Because income-based segmentation is only one part of it, and I wanted to start off with that, because that's a very important implication in terms of how retailers choose the consumers that they go after, what missions do they go after, and what they need to do. So what is really the full picture? This is the full picture. So if you look at it, it's not only the pyramid which matters. Within the pyramid, there are significant differences. Earlier this year, we did a research of close to 12,000 consumers in India to find out really what really drives consumption behavior and shopping behavior. This is the largest ever shopping study done in the history of research in India, close to 12,000 consumers covering different categories, and some of the results were truly mind-boggling. So let me start with the first one, which is, if you look at the affluent segment, people who earn about $20,000 per year, give or take 10 lakhs, are they all alike? And the short answer is no. One can be cute about it and say, you know, there's the 10 lakh and there's the 1 crore and then there's the 10 crore, but that really doesn't tell the picture. The bigger difference, what we found, was driven by what is it that the person does, what is the education, and where is he or she based? So to make it real, if you think about somebody who is earning 20 lakhs, but is actually a trader in Nasik, he's going to be very different than the set of people sitting in this room, many of whom are professionally educated and therefore the tag of professional affluent. Where they shop, how they save, where they spend is, is completely different. So that's the first part of the story. I was talking about the 1 trillion going to the 3.6 trillion. And what is that really driven by? A couple of my colleagues and I have recently released a book which talks about the $10 trillion price, which is the size of the consumer economy in China and India in 2020. We found the biggest driver of this growth is the consumer. And let me make it real for you. A child who was born in 1960 in India could expect to live about 40 years. Per capita consumption at the time of birth was about 240. If the person actually did die at 42, the per capita consumption would have been 530. Over the lifetime, the person would have consumed $15,000. Take this person's grandchild born in 2009, she will live longer, have a higher income, and consume more. At the very least, in two generations, this is going to increase by about 13 times. My colleagues who were co-authoring this are Anglo-Saxon, and with no disrespect to the Anglo-Saxons in the house, uh, they were a bit conservative. So they assume that from 2020 onwards, India will grow at 3% every year. I said, fine, uh, let, let's take that assumption and what happens? And you have 13x. If you increase that 
to 5%, the number increases to 19. That's the power of compounding. If, if as somebody mentioned, you know, the reforms do happen, the government gets it, its act together, then that number could be 25x in two generations. India will consume and shop more. A uh, couple of things to highlight, especially from a retail perspective. If you see the quantum of growth in the next 10 years, the few categories which sound very interesting to me is if we look at the entire housing and consumer durable sector, we are talking about a 4x increase in that space. The penetration of refrigerators in India is just 18% today. China, it's close to 70%. Brazil, it is close to 65%. There is significant potential. If you look at apparel, in the last 10 years, it had grown by about 3.3 times. As people get more money, they are actually going to spend more on things which are not just essentials. We are going to have significant increase in some of these categories that you see here. Food actually did not grow that much in the last 10 years, 2.4 times, except for those of us who overindulge at meals. You know, even if you earn more, it's not that you're going to start eating significantly more. However, there is a big difference which happens in the composition of that diet. The component of dairy, meat, fruits, vegetables increases significantly. And therefore, if you look at in the next 10 years, the one big opportunity which is there is in terms of the processed foods. Currently, it is less than 10%. It actually has the potential to be at least 20 to 25%. So big opportunity everywhere. This chart, I would not bother to go through each of the individual legends. But what this plots is on the x-axis is you have the size of the store. Uh, this takes about 120 different retailers in the US and Europe. And on the left hand, on the y-axis, you have the gross margin per square feet. Um, we actually had to use a logarithmic scale because the range is fairly high. And you actually find the world's class line, the best in class line, and where do Indian retailers lie? Most of the Indian retailers actually will fall even below the 50% of the world-class line. Now, obviously, one has to adjust for the purchasing power parity because what you can buy in 50 rupees here is not, not what you necessarily buy in $1 in the US. But even after that adjustment, there is a clear indication that if we look at from a gross margin per square foot perspective, India is much below the line. Now, what are the options? Margin expansion is something that many people have focused on, uh, but there is only a certain point till which you can squeeze more and more. One can collaborate, negotiate, and there are different euphemisms for the same, but beyond a point, you can't get more out of that. One of the things that at all retail forums, there is the constant discussion around rentals are high. Yes, they are high. But I don't think there is any structural reason why that's going to change soon. Manpower costs only moving north. I haven't heard of anyone actually talking about the fact that their manpower costs are coming down. So if we look at this, so we have the situation where profitability is a challenge. Most of the costs are actually going up. You can squeeze a little bit more from the supply chain and from the suppliers. But where is the big? bang going to come from, if you want to move up on the gross margin, it has to come from shopping. It has to come from more sales, better mix. And I wanted to share a few uh, slides which lay out the finding of some of the research. Now, we've covered this across durables, apparel, furniture, jewelry, etc. But I will stick to the one category which impacts everybody, which is around food and grocery. Some of the things that you will see here are very obvious, intuitive. Some of them are actually not so. So let me start with the first one. Most retailers feel that the big opportunity lies with the high income, with the SECA, really at the top of the pyramid. The answer actually is not necessarily so. So we found out how much do people spend 
on food and grocery across different income segments. And what you find here is, I'm just going to take an example. If you look at the traditional affluent, they spend about $130 per month on food and grocery. If you look at the next income level, they actually spend almost exactly the same. But if you look at the absolute numbers, there are much larger numbers in the second segment. So from an opportunity perspective, the aspirers who are in the seven to $20,000 actually account for a much larger potential than the affluent, while the focus for some may be really talking about the first. The second thing which is interesting is what you see at the right hand side of this chart, the next billion, who most marketers would actually not even consider when creating their marketing plans or the media plans, they actually account for only 30% less in terms of per cap consumption and shopping. However, in terms of numbers, they are much, much larger. So the first point is opportunities are actually there at each of the price points and not necessarily at the higher income levels. Um, this one is fairly obvious, so I won't spend too much time on it. We actually looked at within food and grocery, what is the frequency? Because that actually has a significant implication on how you think about your network strategy, where do you put your formats and how. Um, dairy, it's obvious, it's typically daily. Most of the times it's actually delivered to your home. Uh, but there are others where there is a huge variation and that actually differs by segment. No surprise here, we looked across each of the segments and asked people where they shop, how often they, do they shop, and what's interesting is the fact that the more income you have, the more likely you are to shop at modern trade. But there is a chicken and an egg phenomena here. We looked at this at a disaggregate le level at locations where there have been stores which have been focusing on the lower tier income segments. And actually in those segments, the propensity to consume from modern trade is actually much higher. One of the things that sometimes people ask is if you look at MNCs who have entered India in the last 15 years, what have they done right, what have they done wrong and so on. One of the things, biggest mistakes that some MNCs have made is expecting that the market will develop. They have been waiting for the market to develop and the fact of the matter is some of these markets will not develop unless somebody, that is the retailers or the brand companies, actually develop that market. How does modern trade and traditional trade compare? And whenever I have shared this with some of my retailer friends, they have not been very happy. Because we looked across a bunch of things ranging from location, price, convenience options, salespersons, offers, promotion. How important is it to the consumer? And how does modern trade compare? On a few elements, location, price, price negotiation, credit, fresh, we actually have modern trade faring lower than traditional trade. This is obviously at an average, if you look at your company itself, it could be above or below this chart. But the fact remains that the small retailer today is serving the needs of many consumers better than what modern trade is. And you know, to those who talk about the death of small retailers, I actually belong to a school of thought which says that it's not that small retailers are going to lie low and play dead. I think they are going to offer, and they are offering significant and robust competition to modern trade even today. Um, very interesting thing, food and grocery shopping is actually a group activity. With the spouse, with the family, and the one thing which is a key reason for dissatisfaction in the consumers is the fact that there are three members of the family or sometimes four who actually are not taken care of. And the retailer's botheration is while they get five footfalls, there's actually only one purchase which is happening. So how does one incorporate the group shopping phenomena correctly? 
Uh, I'm going to skip through this one. Uh, one final element. Many consumers come to the store buying the, with a list. However, there are less than 25% who buy purely from the list. And therefore, from an impulse purchase implication, there's actually a huge headway, huge opportunity for growth for retailers to increase the ticket size, to increase, increase the basket size, and to share this benefits with themselves and with the consumers. I've had the opportunity to share some of these findings with a couple of retailers. And what I found interesting every time was while three of the messages or four of the messages out of the seven would have been uh, something that they always intuitively known, there were three or four which were very different in their context. So the one thing to get your gross margin up is to understand and learn how the consumer is shopping and what it would take to get the basket up. Thank you very much. A very good morning to all of you, and a very warm welcome to this, uh, the Mecca of India Retail. And it's indeed a pleasure to be here in terms of uh, sharing our uh, viewpoint on uh, you know, the emerging uh, sort of imperatives and models in India. And I'm going to take off from the point uh, where Abhik left in terms of certain trends in consumerism and uh, also going to add certain more imperatives or rather drivers which are going to shape up Indian retail. Uh, and then we will lead towards the, uh, the imperatives. So these are some of the drivers uh, which we thought are uh, pretty interesting as well as important in the context of how India is emerging. And you would see that some of these drivers are well known. I mean, they are cliched to that extent that they've been spoken uh, to an extent of, uh, you know, don't say it again. But the point is that they still are as valid as or as important as uh, any time before. And, you know, one has to be really conscious of uh, these points in terms of deciding which way to go forward to and what are the imperatives, you know, and they continue to be as secular as, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, the, uh, some of the economic uh, parameters that we see around. So the first is uh, what uh, Abhik mentioned about the demographic part and psychographic part of Indian consumers. And uh, yes, of course, there are favorable uh, signs and, you know, Indian consumers are moving forward and, you know, they're also uh, you know, very getting amenable to shopping kind of thing. So that's the first uh, driver. We will talk about this in a separate slide. The second happens to be more in terms of the competition intensity. And we know India is still a virgin market in terms of the modern trade out of 500 billion or 600 billion, whatever the number is. It's only 5% of the market. And that too is very, very concentrated in urban centers. So I think now is the time perhaps we will see the intensity of competition rising with, uh, uh, with, with a different scale and you know, hopefully with FDI and you know, other things falling in place. And the third is, uh, you know, and, and this seems to be more tactical than strategic, but still from a point of view of retailer, if you ask him, the biggest pain point continues to be, you know, where are the, uh, the, the quality real estate space at a affordable or you know, feasible uh, rental rates. I mean, this is a question which everybody is asking that, uh, you know, what, what's there? And if, if that's not going to change, what is the change I need to make into my retail model? And fourth, uh, is more in terms of technology, but I think now technology is not technology in silos. It's technology which is begin to create business models. And, uh, you know, and there are obvious business models one can see. And, uh, and also in terms of how the customers are being serviced. So very clearly, you know, this could be a game changer in many ways we've seen across the world. And India with such a uh, youth segment, I mean, clearly this is another uh, driver going to be. <coughs> now coming back to the first, uh, and I'll quickly go through because Avik mentioned uh, that, uh, you know, driver in pretty much detail. Uh, yes, I think this is a debatable point, and uh, you know, the other day, the other uh, you know, few months back, I was in uh, you know in an international event, and people were saying that 
the per capita income in India is still not arrived, and you know the doing business in retail in India is tough. So why should I choose between India and let's say China, or uh, Malaysia or Thailand for that matter? You know we have five times more capita income, etc. Yes, that's a reality. But I think the way it has happened in the past, I mean there is no way it is going to go uh, other than northward direction. One can clearly see that income levels will rise. And I think few years down the line, the threshold levels perhaps will be breached in urban centers. Rural, rural is a different economy, and you know, to get into rural retail and to sustain there has been tough, and you know, will continue to be tough. That's what our viewpoint is. And within that process of let's say the income group increasing, you know, and and uh, you know, the per capita growing, I think there will be several niches being created and niches with critical mass and this is a very crude way of segmentation which we have adopted this point of view more from a simplicity standpoint that there is a luxury uh, segment there's a premium affordable and uh, you know one can clearly see is that this is multiples and uh, and this uh, looks like a more of a conservative estimate and that's going to be the case <clears throat> and parallelly India is a very dispersed market. I mean, 600,000 villages, uh, 2,500 towns, if I'm not mistaken. And look at the aspiration of the people who are there in tier two, tier three cities. They're no less than the metro counterparts. And just a matter of time that, you know, with supply reaching them, with the, the other things reaching them, uh, you know, uh, and maybe a little bit of affluence given that, you know, the inclusion part and other things are happening. One would see certainly retail percolating to you know the more number of cities. Today it's 50, 100 cities, but how about 500, 800 towns, etc. So, what are the imperatives in terms of saying what should we have model or you know operating or you know format wise to reach out to these centers? And the second point, uh, which uh, you know, sort of we wanted to discuss, was uh, more in terms of uh, the intensity of competition, which can shape the landscape of India. And there have been figures in the market that you know, the one retailer claiming 1.5 billion dollars, and other is saying maybe half a billion dollars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think, see, FDI, if if it happens, and uh, you know, we can anticipate investments ranging from 10 to 20 billion dollars. That something is again debatable, but. Uh, it, it could significantly sort of uh, impact the landscape, and especially, you know, if the sand scenario, which is what, uh, you know, is happening in terms of states saying that, you know, the favorable states versus the favorable states which are not favoring, maybe, you know, the intensity of competition would be higher in states which, which favor that. And, and third, which is again a reality, and then given that urban masses, or, you know, the urbanization which is happening, and, you know, by we're talking about 30, 40 percent uh, uh, urban uh, population, uh, you know, and growing very fast. We don't anticipate that rentals will come down. Uh, and given also the fact that Indian government doesn't have any clear-cut policy on earmarking places for retail space, so we don't anticipate that to happen. So it again has an implication on the retail models one is going to adopt. The technology, I think, again. The point is that uh, the, the, the number of uh, internet users, uh, you know, one can see very clearly, is uh, are going to jump from 120 to 300 billion dollars. And I think very clearly, you know, point is that if I look at the number of Facebook users and the smartphone uh, users in India, they are not going to be less than any parts of the world. Perhaps we are going to be number one, number two, number three going to. And that is again going to determine the the landscape of India. <clears throat> so these were the four drivers, and you know, and and post that I like to take it to the imperatives or emerging models. And uh, the first one in this is that we anticipate that there will be space for many, and uh, it's also important to define your proposition appropriately. The second is that, you know, the customer engagement model which changed dramatically. You know, one would see that, uh, you know, multi-channel may emerge as the way to market and retail. And third is profitability. Pressures would create compelling reasons to look at the, your format, your 
your, your, the way you operate, etc. And fourth is uh, the way we are anticipating that the traditional retailers would thrive along with the modern trade. So there are opportunities of collaboration there. So let's look at the first one. Uh, given the heterogeneity uh, in India and also the fact that uh, the critical mass is uh, going to be there in each of the niches that we mentioned, we, in, you know, we are looking at a scenario where you know, there would be uh, feasible formats across the uh, you know, segments, so whether it's luxury, premium, affordable, or a format like Aldi. I mean, India has uh, the, the lower middle class, there would be formats which will be available for, uh, you know, for this, uh, this uh, segment. But however, it's very important to define the proposition because, uh, you know, as of now, you know, one can see that you would see that uh, apparel or, uh, you know, footwear segment, there's a clear segmentation, there's a clear proposition. And, uh, you know, you would see that the players have well-defined positioning. But how about other segments? I mean, I'm talking about health and beauty, I'm talking about electronics, I'm talking about uh, maybe food and grocery because there are limited formats available. So, you know, there are, you know, positioning gaps available and it will be very imperative to say that, you know, I'm moving from one size fit all to a customized approach, and, uh, which, is, which is very well segmented, uh, you know, uh, model. So that's one. The second thing is that the way consumers are shopping are very different from the way it has happened in the past. And this is not futuristic. This is something which is uh, right now at this moment. And, uh, you know, we talked about number of uh, Facebook user, we talked about the smartphone, and I was amazed to see the number of smartphones as 9.5% of the market share uh, in the world will be taken by Indian users in terms of smartphones. So, so it is going to be fairly, uh, you know, a game changer kind of thing. And just to share one number with you, I think Facebook released uh, official case study yesterday about healthy beauty, health and beauty player, and they're saying, 20% of the business is coming from Facebook users. So, so to that extent, this, this is going to change the, uh, the model uh, going forward. And uh, we talked about the profitability pressures. And, uh, and uh, so there is an imperative need to sort of match these diverse trends of uh, the widening assortment and unfavorable rentals, uh, because SQ is increasing, but the space is getting more and more costly. So how do we match that? And perhaps, you know, you know people may look at uh, the, the store sizing, as of now, you know, uh, looking at consumer durable retailing, for example, you know, people are looking and saying that, can I reduce the size and, you know, maybe have certain portion of my sales going to digital channel. And I'd like to just, uh, you know, give a hypothetical case which we modeled, and we said if it is possible to move 5% of uh, your sales to digital channel, there is a possibility of, uh, you know, reducing your uh, operating expenses, which is the expenses as in the rental expenses, and maybe increase your EBITDA level significantly. And uh, so this could happen with other categories, especially the consumer durable retailing, and there's a possibility of, uh, you know, increasing your EBITDA levels to that extent. And the second point which we, I wanted to mention about the imperative was more in terms of the consumer expectations are rising like anything. They are being exposed to multiple things. So, you know, whether it's in terms of e-commerce players, uh, you know, creating delight for them, or the hospitality, or the travel industry. That is going to rub off the, the Indian retailers. And uh, perhaps there is a need for looking at the operation more frequently than, than before, because the you know, consumer is changing rapidly, the expectation levels are going uh, you know, up only. And in that light, you know, one would like to see that, you know, how do we change our, you know, or, or uh, you know, align our operations to meet the customer expectation. The fourth point we mentioned about uh, the coexistence of traditional retails, and, and, and I think people would agree here that you know, there are uh, the outlets, the traditional outlets are going to thrive along with the modern trade. We're talking about 12 million outlets and they're growing and you know, with consumption growing, the share of pie, et cetera, would also, you know, they would continue to have a significant pie. So there are collaboration 
opportunities which are possible and uh, including uh, you know the cash and carry the franchising opportunity and placement of private labels and and one would you know like to include them in into the business plan uh, as the as the retail landscape emerges so these are just a summary of uh, the imperatives i would like to leave it here with the audience to have a look at uh, these imperative once again thank you so much for your time good morning everyone uh, my name is heman kalbag i work with at carney as a partner in the consumer industries uh, and retail practice uh, when the um, images group which is the organizer of this conference uh, asked me to speak about fdi and the uh, GRDI, the Global Retailer Development Index that AT Carney produces every year, uh, it was probably uh, days, if not uh, maximum a week, before our government announced the opening up of FDI in multi-brand retail. So um, uh, I obviously stepped back and, and, and thought about my presentation and uh, wondered if I should change any of the pages I was going to share with you today. Uh, and my conclusion was probably not. I think the messages haven't changed that much on uh, a, our Global Retail Development Index and our perspective on FTI. So I'll spend about uh, 10 minutes going through a few slides on this topic. Just, just in terms of context, what is the GRDI? GRDI is an annual publication that AT Carney does that ranks uh, 30 economies around the world on a relative index in terms of attractiveness as new markets to enter. Um, Obviously, India has featured very prominently on this index many times over. In fact, India has been number one four times in the last 10 years. This past year, India slipped to, to number five. And uh, I must say that you know, some of the, the evaluation that was done was before we had a clear indication from our government on uh, FDI. So, um, so if this index is a measure of both the risk and the attractiveness, of course, it's heavily shaped by uh, the choices our government makes and in terms of guiding new investments and the openness for foreign retailers. So again, this is not an index of attractiveness of markets. It's attractiveness of entry for foreign retailers in these 30 economies. Uh, so please bear that in mind. In terms of how the countries lay out, obviously, uh, India fares extremely well, both in terms of market potential and country risk. Uh, for those of you who are interested and in thinking about global expansion, what's interesting is that sub-Saharan African countries are uh, extremely attractive and rising. Uh, but having said that, what's germane probably to most of you is the market potential that India offers, and we project a, a continued 15 to 20 percent growth rate, at least in the organized retail segment. I say this cautiously, but I say it. We, we anticipate favorable FDI norms uh, and significant expansion by global players into the country and minimal risk as we think about the future. So uh, why is India so attractive? It's obviously attractive because uh, of the reason all of you are here and all of us are betting on the future of the economy. We have fundamentally strong macroeconomic drivers. We have, uh, while the introduction talked about a slowdown in, in the GDP, we still have a GDP growth rate that's enviable to most Western economies. We have a rising disposable income, and we have very rapid urbanization that's happening. And then on the right side of this chart, uh, we have fairly good demographics. So it looks, our demographics look like a pyramid. Now, if you look at countries uh, like China, many people say that, that China will age faster than it will become rich, because the China demographic uh, for the population looks a little bit like an upside down triangle. If you look at the United States, it looks like a diamond. So India is one of the few countries globally that offers a growing consumer for the next 50, 60 years, and that's very, very attractive to any retailer, whether of foreign or of Indian origin. Not only that, we have rising incomes, and we have you know, a workforce that's 50% you know, uh, under the age of 30, so this makes for very, very uh, exciting and enticing demographics. So besides the large market potential, there are obviously uh, some interesting things that are happening in, in the market. The, the recent FDI changes, uh, allowing 100% uh, of foreign ownership in single brand retail, 51% in multi brand retail, uh, is very, very exciting. Uh, large global players, many have already committed to entry, 
and uh, uh, some might be in the audience today. Uh, there might be local retailers who are talking to some of these guys. But you can bet that there is not a global retailer that's out there that is not thinking seriously about the Indian market today. Uh, whether they're already committed to being in the country through a cash and carry format or through a joint venture or they're exploring the market, I, I am confident that every single retailer of any consequence globally will at least think about the Indian market in the next 12 months. There's a large opportunity in tier two and three towns. Again, this message hasn't changed over the last uh, few years, except uh, I think many retailers have realized that the opportunity exists and are actively pursuing it now. What are the challenges that, that companies uh, have to overcome? Obviously, I think trying to understand and overcome the local sourcing norms. Um, there were some articles in the paper today about what some one of the companies is doing. But understanding these, having clarity around them, and solving it will be a very critical next step in our retail expansion journey. Number two is the discretion of state governments. Uh, while FDI has been allowed, companies still need to figure out how the states will react. Uh, very often, you know, I get queries from either companies or journalists when they ask me, how will the states react? Candidly, I don't know. I have no idea. But any retailer that's committing to being India in a, in a big way has to now figure out state by state what the opportunity will be. Uh, and I think that's a, it's a significant challenge to overcome. And then finally, there is, we, you know, we talk about uh, 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 consistent support from the central government because there is a possibility that there might be a change in, in the dominant party in the central government. And there are concerns that with that change may come reversals of policies. So I think it's imperative for, for the government, uh, for all of us, for India in general, to give confidence to global retailers that we are committed to this journey and we're not going to take steps backwards. Other than some of the legislation, legislation changes, there's obviously other changes that are happening that are, while small in, in the overall macro sense, are very exciting uh, for the country and for the consumer. Uh, there is a growth of luxury. Uh, as a market, it's growing at 30% every year. So for retailers uh, who uh, or the luxury retailers who have historically been, in some ways, uh, leading the pack in terms of global expansion, this is a very good sign. Uh, the market is projected to grow to about $7 billion last year, and probably growing at, at 20% means that this is a significant market uh, for, for our uh, luxury players. And also e-retailing. While a very small base, the growth rate is staggering 80%. So it creates new options for the consumer, it creates new options for the retailers, and it creates new options for all of us. L let me talk about this very briefly. Um, there is a window of opportunity in each country that is important for global retailers to follow. Uh, and this window of opportunity keeps shifting. What that means is if you're maturing or closing, doesn't mean that as a market you have matured or closed. What it means is the window of opportunity as a new global retail entrant is closing in on you. So obviously, if, if, you, if you look back at the GRDI index for three, four years ago, India was clearly at peaking. But with the significant investment that's already come in, the significant progress that domestic retailers have made, that window of opportunity has been closing. So for the global retailers out there, I think they need to think about this opportunity quickly before India enters the maturing and closing phase, where it'll become much more difficult as a new retailer to win. You know, uh, very often, uh, mostly journalists ask me, you know, uh, what is the impact of FDI? How will it impact the Kirana shops? But the question we should be asking is, how will it impact the consumer? And you know, what we have learned from examples in the past, whether you look at the automotive industry that liberalized significantly in the 90s and 2000, and that created you know, a production of from 5 million uh, vehicles in 2002 to 18 million in 2011, and not to mention the consumer choices that it's created. All of us as com consumers must have experienced the abundant choice we now have in automobiles, in telecom, uh, in media, so why not replicate that choice in retail as well? So while obviously uh, the Kirana shops continue to be an important constituent, uh, but more so for politicians than business people, we should be thinking about the consumer and what choices we'll create for the consumer. And then finally, um, you know, as we think about the future, the question is how will FDI impact all of us? Um, 
by no means do we claim to know all the answers, but, but as any good consultant, I guess at least we know the question to ask. The first question is, what will the industry mix be like? Who will dominate the future retail market? Uh, there will be a lot of discussions uh, in terms of international retailers versus dom domestic retailers. Is there a real difference? What joint venture and convergence opportunities will it create? How much will shift to online retail? Uh, it gives access to tier two and tier three towns in a very meaningful way. What will the segment mix be like? While Mindshare is heavily dominated by food and grocery because of the size of consumption, how will that mix change over time? How important will apparel be? How important will consumer electronics be? What other new segments of consumption will emerge because of FDI opening up? That's, these are important questions to answer. And then finally, how will this shape consumer behavior? Will FDI trigger adoption of these formats in a more meaningful way? Will organized retail penetrate faster because we'll see a lot more investment and perhaps uh, a more evolved offering in the marketplace? And then finally, what does this mean for talent? Uh, currently, retail employs about 8% of the skilled workers, uh, but as we all know, middle management is hard to find. So will this create new caters of talent that will be available to all of us in the future? So these are some of the questions we're thinking about as we think about FDI in the future. Thank you. Well, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Paul Martin. I am the managing director of Planet Retail. Planet Retail is a global research company. As you can probably tell from my accent, I am uh, based in London in the United Kingdom, but we do have uh, colleagues based all around the world. So I'm going to take a, uh, a slightly uh, wider approach uh, in this presentation. So you've heard from uh, my distinguished peers uh, around what's happening uh, in India at the moment. Uh, I'm actually going to look at some of the key emerging markets around the world and not just looking at countries specifically, but uh, I'm going to take a look at some specific cities. So this uh, presentation comes off the back of a uh, very large research report we conducted with our dear friends at Deloitte and we launched at the World Retail Congress in London three weeks back. For a number of years, we have uh, been looking at uh, what we called hidden heroes. These are key markets that are maybe not on the top agenda of retail CEOs, but also uh, the uh, key executives of large consumer goods manufacturers. Um, and the, the, the answer why we moved into cities is quite simple, because we ran out of uh, countries uh, to profile. So we had looked at uh, Kazakhstan, Nigeria, Peru, Colombia, etc. And we were sitting with our global advisory board, which uh, are, uh, is con constituted of um, C-level board members uh, within some global retailers, and they said to us, well, one of the key important components for us when we look at entering into new markets is understanding city economies. We don't always look at a country in general because we will enter a, uh, a specific, uh, specific city. So this is why we're going to uh, look at some key cities today. These are the 10 cities featured in the report. If you are interested in the report, you can go to planetretail.net. You can uh, download this report. As mentioned, it was launched about three weeks ago. Um, so who uh, or where are these key cities? Um, to start off with, we have two in Latin America, which is uh, Bogota and Lima. We have uh, to uh, also reiterate the point around uh, the interest levels in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Lagos and Nairobi, uh, two cities in sub-Saharan Africa, but the, uh, the bulk of the cities we profiled uh, are all in Asia. We have uh, Yekaterinburg in Russia, we have Kolkata here in India, Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam, Jakarta in Indonesia, Manila in the Philippines, and uh, a really good pub quiz question, what is the largest city in China? It is not Shanghai, uh, it is actually a city called Chongqing. Uh, 